Today's topic is programmable logic devices. So the circuits we've been studying so far, these combinational logic type circuits, generally follow the process that we have a particular truth table, and then we use some method, maybe a, a K-map, something like that, or a programmable version of that, to come up with a minimized logic function. And then we figure out which logic gates we need to connect and how we connect those to then actually get a physical implementation of that logic function. Now, to actually do this, of course, we would require that you put the different gates on a, on a board, printed circuit board, and have different uh, copper traces that would represent the different interconnections and then solder the chips to the, to the board. And that's a pretty involved process. And if you have lots of gates, you have lots of chips, you know, there's a lot of real estate on the board. That's kind of uh, expensive, too, to do it for mass production. So somewhere late 60s, oh, let's just say around 1970s, uh, people started to uh, use the fact that the ability to make ever larger integrated circuits was being developed, started to develop devices, which we call programmable logic devices, PLDs. And these would have typically, well, the early ones, you know, a number of AND and OR gates, and then the key to them was a reconfigurable, or at least a configurable, set of interconnections that could be configured electrically. You didn't have to go in and wire things and, and solder things. Uh, and then eventually, the, the first ones were, the, the configuration, once it was uh, burned into place, so to speak, was permanent. Uh, if you wanted to redo it, change the logic function, or you had a mistake, you wanted to fix it, you'd have to pull the chip out and get a new chip. But eventually people developed techniques for making um, reconfigurable interconnections that could be erased electrically as well as formed electrically. And then as time went on, people made ever larger PLDs, and eventually you got to what might be called complex programmable logic devices, and these would have enough gates on them to be able to implement significant logic functions and also often even uh, something we'll study later in the course, which are called flip-flops, which act as memory devices. And then you could implement what's called sequential logic, which is like a computer does, where you have a clock and you run uh, at different clock cycles, you run different logic functions and do things through time as well as distributed throughout a number of logic gates. Um, today, the kind of state-of-the-art version of this would be called uh, field programmable gate arrays. And these can be complex enough that you can actually take one of these and program a complicated device, like a, a complete microcontroller or something like that. Okay, so we're going to talk just really about the, the simpler basis of this you know an F FPGAs would be a whole course of, it, of its own let's look at a very simple kind of cartoon PLD so first we're gonna have a circuit symbol this is called a resistor and it has the property that if there's a voltage drop across the resistor from one end to the other of V, that an electrical current I is equal to V over R flows through it. So it's called a resistor because it resists the flow of current. You could also write this this way. V is equal to RI, which is called Ohm's law. And it just shows that the bigger the resistance for a given amount of current, you're going to get a bigger voltage. And then we also have another symbol. This is called a diode.
And for our purposes, this is like an electronic uh, or electrical, I guess you'd say, check valve. And it only allows current to flow in one direction. So in the direction of the arrow here. If you try to make current flow in the other direction, it blocks it. So for our purposes, that's a decent description of the two components we need. Oh, okay, and then finally, sorry, one more component little wave thing like this is going to be a fuse, which you're probably familiar with. So a fuse is a device that conducts electricity, but if the current exceeds a certain level, then the fuse blows and no longer conducts electricity. So let's take a look at a circuit here. So this is some supply voltage we'll call VCC. And then we have a resistor. And we've got three connections here. And each of those is connected through a fuse. And then we've got diodes over here. And then those are connected to inputs labeled A, B, C, and this point is an output labeled Y. This is a resistor R. So this is going to implement some simple logic function of the input variables A, B, and C, and that logic function will be right, some Y is equal to F of A, B, and C. All right, so what does this do in its current state? Well, suppose that the voltage at terminal A, B, and C are all equal to the supply voltage VCC. Then the voltage difference between here and there would be zero. And there would be no voltage drop across this resistor, no current would flow, the voltage here would be also be VCC, the voltage everywhere would be VCC. And so in that case, Y Let's say, say the voltage at Y. Well, and of course, this would, in our reckoning of the relation between voltage and logic level, this would mean that A, B, and C would all be logic level one, high. So in that case, Y, the voltage at Y, would be VCC, and that would mean that Y would also be one. Now, what would happen if, let's say, the voltage at A and B remained VCC, but we set the voltage at C to be equal to zero, grounded it? What would happen then? So now you would have this voltage here, this VCC. If no current flowed through the resistor, this voltage here would also be VCC, but then you'd have a high voltage here, low voltage there, current would want to flow in this direction through, through the arrow into input C like that. And that current would flow such that it would also flow then down here through the resistor such that this voltage right here would be equal to zero. So that current would indeed be, according to this formula, it would be VCC over R. And then Y would be equal to zero because this voltage would be zero, so the logic level would be zero. So this would be, VC would be equal to zero, and we just said VY would then be equal to zero. So we would say A equals B equals one, C equals zero, and we get that Y is equal to zero. And that would be true if we had made A equal to zero or B equal to zero, any combination of those, or both A and C, or both in A and B, or all three. So what we would have implemented here would be the logic function, Y equals A and B and C. For this to stay high, for this to stay at voltage VCC, 
all three of these have to be high, so there's no path for current to flow from this higher voltage to down to ground. If any one or any combination of these was to go to zero, then current could flow, and that current would cause a voltage drop across this resistor, and then the voltage at terminal Y would go to zero, and the logic state of Y, the logic level, would be zero. So this gives you a three input AND gate. Now you can uh, do variations of that to get an OR gate, uh, but that's not really our, our purpose here. Now we want to turn to the existence of these fuses. Now suppose we make uh, V at B equals minus V big. Okay, so now the voltage drop, instead of just being VCC minus zero, is going to be VCC minus minus V big, uh, and your current I would be VCC plus V big over R, and that's enough to blow the fuse connected to line B. So after that, this is what you would have for your circuit. You'd blow the B, the B fuse. It would be VCC. Oops. And uh, you'd have the A fuse and the C fuse, but the B fuse would be blown. There's A, B, and C. And here's Y. So what does this circuit do now? Well, now it doesn't depend on the voltage at terminal B because it's not even connected to the rest of the circuit. So I can make the logic level at B be 1 or 0. It has no effect. And what I'm left with now is just that Y is equal to A and C. So this is a very simple programmable logic device. In this case, it's a three input AND gate that can be programmed to be a two input AND gate by just blowing one of these fuses. So that's the, the idea in, in an extremely like cartoon level simple circuit of a programmable logic device. And in fact, they were initially implemented with these blowable fuses and once you blew the fuse that was it you know putting the, there was no putting the fuse back these days these instead of fuses you have uh, connections that are controlled by transistors and those transistors can be reprogrammed uh, to either conduct like the fuse does or to be an open circuit like the blown fuse is Now let's consider the following circuit, just consists of wires and some connections. We'll call this wire A, and this wire B, and this wire C. And then here, let me do it in a different color. We'll have wire X, wire now, let me move this over one here, a little more space, wire Y, and wire Z. Then, we put fuses between the wires like so. So between A and all three of X, Y, and Z, and between B and all three of X, Y, and Z, and between C and all three of X, Y, and Z. Okay. Now, as, it, as it's uh, configured right here, every wire is connected to every other wire. But if we go through and blow some of these fuses, well, then we can change those connections. So if we would just want A to be connected 
to Y, but we would want to keep this fuse and blow these two fuses. And if we wanted B to be connected to X, well, we would keep this fuse and blow those two, and so on. So this is a reconfigurable interconnection. Uh, this is some kind, sometimes called a, a crossbar uh, or a matrix configuration. All right, so we can have these any number of wires in the horizontal direction, any number of the wires in the vertical direction, and every wire in the horizontal direction is connected to every vertical wire by a fuse. And then by blowing certain fuses, we can then make any wire that's horizontal be connected to any wire or multiple wires uh, that are vertical. Okay. So here now is what we can do with that to make a programmable logic circuit. So let's say this is logic level A on this wire. And then we come down here and we've got an inverter. So that's going to be not A. And then here's B. Logic level B and then not B. Okay, so we'll just stop there for now. And now let's draw some vertical wires. And these are maybe going to be fed into AND gates. Oops. And we'll have two over here. And let's see, two over here. Okay, and then I'm going to put these little squares here, and those are going to represent those fuses that can either be blown. If they're open like this, they would be blown, and there would be no connection. Or if we fill them in, then we don't blow the fuse, and then there is a connection between those two crossing wires. So this is our reconfigurable matrix of connections. Very well. So suppose we uh, keep this connection and that connection. Then what? Do, then this is an AND gate here. What is the logic function produced by that AND gate? Well, this would be connected to A and the second input to not B. So this would be A and not B. And let's see. How about if this second gate uh, we connected here and there. So we, we blow the other fuses, but leave those ones connected. Well, this is uh, not A and this is B. So this is not A and B. Very well. And now, down here, we're going to have another set of connections. They're going to go into a three input OR gate. Oops. And those will also have reprogrammable connections through fuses that can be blown or not blown. And we'll call this output here Y. Now suppose we keep this fuse and we keep that fuse. Then what is Y? Well, let's see. So now we've got three inputs to this OR. And the first one is A and not B. And it's an OR gate, so then the next one will be OR, not A and B. And so this implements the logic function Y is equal to A and not B, or 
not A and B. And if we wanted to reconfigure it, we could do that. Now, in this case, we haven't used this third AND gate. Um, and we haven't connect, made any connections here to this third input of the OR gate. And we assume that that doesn't change anything. So we'll talk about that a little bit, a little bit later. So this will just now act as a two input OR gate with these two AND gates producing the inputs. Okay. Now, just by changing these, these connections over here, we could have any sum of two two-factor products, right? This is a sum of products form with uh, two input variables, A and B. And if we had more AND gates, we could have more possible products, right? And if we had, and in fact, with two input variables, how many products are there? There's four possible. And then if we had more OR gates, we could have more OR functions. In this case, with three inputs, we could have a, an OR of three of these AND functions. So we could have a sum of three products, and each product would have two, two factors. All right, and this, uh, by the way, A and not B, or not A and, not, and B, that is actually the uh, exclusive OR operation. Okay, so this is a sum of products, programmable sum of products, PLD. Sum of products. And that was one of the first types that was uh, developed, very popular still, because we know that any logic function can be implemented as a sum of products. Now, the limitation would be on the number of logic gates you had. To do a general two-input system, we would need to have completely general two-input logic function of the form f of a and b. There would be a total of four possible products, a and b, a and not b, not a and b, not a and not b. So that would require four AND gates, and they would be two input, four two input AND gates. And then for the OR, well, to implement a single logic function, then you would just OR one or more of those, uh, those outputs of the AND gate. So you'd have one, and then you'd be in general a four input, or gate, and then that could implement an arbitrary two-input logic function. Now, of course, if you got into, you know, say an eight-input logic function, well, now you're going to, you know, look at all the possible products you would have in that case, uh, and it gets much, much, much bigger. So in practice, what is done with the PLD is that you have a many fewer gates, then you would actually need to implement a completely arbitrary logic function. Because most logic functions don't require all possible products, right? So just a limited number of, of products. And also not as, net as you know, the number of uh, inputs then to the OR gates is, is kept reduced to also. Now, I want to talk a little bit about what happens, as in the previous case, where you have some inputs and say you've got three inputs and two of them have connections, but the third one you want to leave floating. You don't want to connect anything to it because you only have two products you want to do an OR of and you have a three input OR gate. So here's what we can do. We can use so-called pull up and pull down resistors. So suppose this is here, this represents a wire. And then we put a resistor here connected to that wire and we connect it to the other end to the high voltage, to the supply voltage. So if I don't connect anything else to that wire, the default voltage is high, which is 
a logic level one. And on the other hand, if we, this is my wire. And we connect through a resistor to ground, zero volts. And we don't connect anything else to that wire. Well, then the default is logic level zero, zero volts. Now, let's say we have the default one here and we connect, say, some logic gate to that. Got some output, and we put it up here. Now, if this output value is equal to one, then that means this wants to set the wire voltage to VCC, and that was the default value before. There wouldn't be any voltage drop across this resistor, and so no current would flow, and so everything would be happy. What if this output logic value, though, was zero? That would mean that this gate is trying to make this wire go to zero volts. Well, that's okay, because you would have then a voltage drop across this resistor of VCC, minus zeros, VCC, and so some current would flow. And that current would be VCC over R. And we could choose R to be as big or small as we needed to be to make that current whatever we want it to be. And that current would then flow and go down into the gate. And so as long as the gate could handle that current, and we could make that current small just by making the R big enough, then everything would be happy. And we could now allow this wire to be drawn from a logic level one down to a logic level zero by this gate or any other thing that's connected to that wire. Right? And likewise, over here where the default is zero, now say we have this, this gate here. Uh, and of course, if the output is zero, then that's not changing the value of the wire. No current flows, fine, everything's fine. But let's say it wants to assert a logic level of one. That means it wants to make this voltage go up to VCC. Okay, well, in that case, you'd have VCC minus zero would be the voltage drop. Current I would flow here, and it would flow out of the logic gate and through the resistor. And again, we can make R big enough that that current would be small enough that the logic gates would be happy. Okay, so that's how we can make a wire that is floating have a default value. And what default value would we want to use? Well, usually for an AND gate, let's say we've got three inputs here, A, B, and C, we'd usually want to have the default be logic level one, high voltage. Why? Suppose, right, because this, what does this thing implement? This implements Y equals A and B and C. So say C floats, what happens? Well, then it becomes Y equals A and B, and C is equal to 1, which is just A and B. In other words, in that case, if we don't connect anything to one of these wires, we leave it floating, then it just goes away. And then the 3 input AND gate becomes a 2 input AND gate. How about for an OR gate? And we've got three inputs, A, B, and C. In this case, we're going to want a default of zero, because Y equals A or B or C. And suppose C floats then this would go to its default value of zero and you'd have A or B or zero, which is just A or B. Because anything or zero is just the thing, just like anything and one is the thing, okay? All right, so using that, I, that principle, then in these other types of circuits here, uh, it's okay to not connect one of the wires, and then it just floats it. In this case, for the OR input, it would be just zero. So this would then just become a two-input OR gate. Now, we'll, so we'll assume that in everything we talk about from now on. So if we don't connect to a wire, it just, if it's an input of, of an AND gate, it defaults to one. If it's an input of an OR gate, it defaults to zero. Now, as the number of gates in the programmable logic device grows, so do the number of wires, and then 
it gets kind of tiresome to draw the diagrams and they get very busy. So we have kind of a shorthand for our schematics. We can do the following here. Okay, so here is A and not A. And B. And not B. And then for these crossbars, we're just going to draw one, like so. And then we'll just draw our AND gate. And it looks like it has only one input, but the you kind of use your, your logical thinking here. This would actually represent two wires. And likewise over here for the second AND gate, it's actually going to represent two wires. We could think of this as a, a two wire bus. And then if we draw certain connections, like say we do something like this, A and B, well then that would just mean in these two wires, that would be like we had in the previous picture up here, something like this. There'd be two wires and one would be connected to A and the other would be connected to B. So it looks like you have them, two connections to the same wire, but understanding this concept just so you can figure it out logically right there can only be two inputs here because you would never want to have both a and not a connected because then one of these was is going to be one and the other is going to be zero and if you connect one and zero together you get a short circuit so you're only going to connect one or the other of these and one or the other of these okay and so then we can have a third one over here and then likewise the inputs to the OR gate would do the same thing. It looks like they're all three connected to one wire, but this actually would represent three wires. And so if we say connect to that and that, it would be going back up to this previous picture, it'd be like connecting this top wire and the bottom wire, connecting this gate to the input here and this gate to the input. Okay. So once you kind of have this picture in mind, then we can use this shorthand here so that things so aren't, aren't so un, uh, unwieldy. Now, as we mentioned before, um, if you have N, uh, an N input logic function, that has two to the N truth table rows and each each truth table row is represented by a min term which is a product of the n inputs so in principle you'd need 2 to the n n input and gates and of course then you'd need for a single logic function you would need one now how many inputs would you need for your or gate at the output well in, in principle up to two to the n so that would be the most general logic function okay so most logic functions aren't going to use all two to the n of the rows in the truth table in fact if you did it would become the trivial logic function that would be true for every row in the truth table, which is by is equal to one. And then in practice, right, uh, most logic functions are probably going to need far fewer than that. And so you have a trade-off. Oops. This um, our our decision here is going to going to trade off. Let's just say this. We'll trade off. generality versus cost or complexity and cost. So if you want to keep the devices cheap, you're probably going to try to use fewer gates. That won't make them as general, but maybe it'll be enough that most applications will be good enough. Um, and then manufacturers would typically have different PLDs that they would offer that would have, you know, more capabilities and so if you needed more you'd pay a little more and 
then there would be a trade-off there, again, from cost and uh, generality. So, say this is your PLD. This has one, two, three, four inputs. Okay, so if it was a completely general uh, logic function capable circuit, it would have two to the four equals 16 AND gates. And they would be four input AND gates. How do we actually have here? Uh, well, we got six. Okay, so that, that limits us. Now we have uh, three OR gates. That means we can implement three different logic functions. These have to be, right, so these, these here are, um, these have to be four input. And these have to be, well, they have to be able to connect to any of these six AND gate outputs. So these have to be six input. Okay, well, let's see, uh, half of 16 would be 8, and in principle, you can implement any logic function with, with 8 rows of the truth table, because if you have more than 8 rows that have 1s, then you can implement the, the inverse logic function, and it'll have fewer than 8 rows. So this is probably, probably good enough for most, most uh, applications, but that's certainly less than the the total number for completely general. So here you got three logic functions, output variables or logic functions. And again, we're using this as shorthand, right? This would be, each one of these would have four wires and each one of these would have six wires. This would become very, very crowded. Now, how do you actually do the programming on these? We have, well, we'd have to, in, in, in the old case anyway, where we actually had fuses, be, between each of these crossing wires, you would uh, basically have a schematic of your logic circuit. That you want to implement. And then you'd have a software package that would end up producing a series of say, fuse blowing commands and then you you put those into a programmer chip programmer and then that would blow the fuses go through one by one and apply voltages to every set of the crossing wires such that you would blow desired fuses And that would leave the desired connections. Now these days, you're more likely to use actually a, a type of um, hardware description language, a programming language. HDL, and the two most popular ones are called uh, Verilog and VHDL. And these, they look somewhat like the C programming language, and they have different commands and different blocks, uh, except that they have, you know, uh, inputs and outputs that represent the different uh, pins output of the chip and um, different logic gates and things like that. Uh, and they, of course, these can also handle the what we'll study later, which is the sequential logic concepts. But if you're just doing a combinational type of logic here, like we, where we have no memory elements, um, then this would produce all of the low-level, you know, fuse blowing commands these days. That you wouldn't actually blow fuses; you'd put charges on the gate of a insulated gate transistors to to make connections or not make connections. And then you would have some uh, wires that would go to your chip, usually some kind of programming port, and you'd upload that configuration to the chip and burn, you know, 
quote, burn it into the chip, and now the chip would uh, be able to be used for your, your different applications. If you ever want to change that, you'd hook up to your programming port again and change the configuration. Now, during the development of programmable logic device technology, you had an interesting situation where di various different companies kind of came up with their own variations on these ideas and trademarked different uh, different names for these sort of devices. So there was the PAL, which is the uh, Programmable Array Logic Related Concept, the GAL, the Generic Array um, Logic were two of the popular ones. Also, PLA Programmable Logic Array. Uh, so, in particular, this PAL, Programmable Array Logic, an example shown over here on the left, these um, typically had programmable inputs to the AND gates, but then fixed configurations with the OR gates. So, this reduced the cost because you only needed one set of uh, programmable interconnections. Uh, but, of course, it limits the reconfigurability of the entire system. So, it's somewhat limiting, but at a lower cost. Now, in the case shown here, we have three outputs, four inputs. Um, you could have one, two, three, four, five, six rows in the truth table, six min terms. But you can only OR two of those for any one of these logic functions. So it seemed like you wouldn't be able to implement a logic function with this kind of a structure that, say, needed to have three of the rows of the truth table. Like, for example, let's say we wanted to have Y1 be equal to not A2 and not A1 and A0 or not A2 and A1 and not A0 or A2 and A1 and A0, right? So what would you do? So not, not A2, not A1 and A0. Okay, so for this first uh, AND gate, not A2, not A1, and A0, that would be that connection. Let's see, and then we'd have not A2, A1, and A0, not A2, A1, and A0, and that would be it for this, this OR gate, and that would, of course, be, well, I should have put that on Y1, but this would be Y0, would be these, those functions right there, we could put into Y0, but then that leaves this other row in the truth table, unaccounted for. Uh, however, there's a little more versatility to this kind of structure than may appear at first sight. Because what we can do is illustrated here. We can feed back one of these output logic functions as a new input. So here we would have Y0 would implement, let's see, this is not A2, and not A1, right, because it's on the inverted side here, and A0. Or, over here, not A2, and A1, and not A0. Now, that Y0 is then fed back here into a variable A3, and then for this uh, y1 now is what? It's the or of these two and functions. The first one is just a3, which is y0. Or, and then over here, what do we implement? Well, this is a2 and a1 and a0. And so with that, y1 becomes the logic function we wanted to implement. Now we had to 
do like an intermediate logic function here, which, which had just two rows from the truth table, and then we could use that as a new input variable uh, and combine it with another row to get our desired logic function. And some of these uh, PAL chips would actually have internal circuitry to allow you to, to do this, this feedback. So you could actually program that in without actually having to take a wire for this output of the chip and feeding it back to this input pin. All right, and then of course, you know, the more inputs and outputs you have would have, the more of this kind of these sort of tricks you could could play. Um, but again, it, it comes down to the the trade-offs between uh, the cost of keeping the chip simple uh, and the desire to have the versatility to implement more and more complicated logic functions. And so there would generally be a range of different programmable logic devices. They'd usually be designated by the maybe the number of inputs, the number of outputs, the number of AND gates, the number of OR gates, and things like that. Now we've been saying with PLD, usually, you know, if you have N inputs, you would have two to the N truth table rows. Let's just say rows. And we've been saying that you know, usually in practice you'd want to have fewer than this number of AND gates. However, before people even had developed programmable logic devices, they had wanted to make a version of that which would have, in fact, two to the N rows. And this was a device that was called programmable read only memory or prom. So an example of this would be, uh, let's just have a, a two input. So if this is going to be the n equals two case, we would have here, say, uh, input a1. And then we would negate that to get not A1. And then input A0 and negate that to get not A0. Okay, so this is a N equals 2 case. And, and let's have here our and gates. Again, remember this uh, shorthand here notation would represent um, two wires here for the two possible inputs. And let's suppose that we connect here and here. And so this would be A1 is 0 and A0 is 0. So this would be inputs 0, 0. And over here, say we have these two here, so that's A1 is 0 and A0 is 1, so that's 0, 1. Then over here, we have uh, here and here, these two. So that's A1 is 1 and A0 is 0, so that's 1, 0. And then extend this out over here. We would have um, here and here, and this is A1 is 1, A0 is 1, so this would be 1, 1. So there would be all four of the rows in the truth table, and these would just be the, you know, we would have all the different combinations of the A1 and A0 input variables. Now with that, then let's have these output of these AND gates extend down, and now we can pull off and do our OR combinations. Let's say this is Y3. And this is Y2. And this is Y1.
and this is y0. Okay, and remember, <coughs> our shorthand, there are four of these outputs, so each of these would be four input OR gates. And suppose our connections were there and there, and for the next one, here and here, and then here and here, and then there and there. What would this do? If you put in a particular value of A1 and A0, it would turn on just one of these AND gates and the others would be off. So, for example, let's say you put in both were zero. What well, would turn on these two outputs and the other two would be off. And if we just write that, what are the, the bits? Y3, Y2, Y1, and Y0. They would be 0, 1, 1, 0. And for the next case where we had A1 is 0 and A0 is 1, we would have 1, 0, 0, 1. And for the third case where A1 is 1 and A0 is 0, we would have 0, 1, 0, 0. And for the final case where A1 and A0 are both 1, we would have 1, 0, 1, 1. So, instead of thinking about these as logic functions, because we had the word memory in here, we would think about these as half bytes or nibbles of stored data. If we had added four more OR gates, we could have complete bytes, and then this would be what we'd call a, well, as it is, it's a two by four prom. It has two inputs, which we would think of as the address of this stored data. And then four bits of output, so a half byte or a nibble. If, and if we extended this and had four more of these OR gates, we'd have a two by eight prom. It would s store whole bytes of data and it would have four memory registers, if you want to think of it that way, or memory addresses. Not very many, right? But then if we add more and more of these address bits, well, like if we had eight of them, that would be an, an, an eight by eight prom if we had eight outputs. And two to the eight is 256, so that could store 256 bytes. Right? So you'd use a version of this if you, uh, on your computer, and this would be for the, uh, the BIOS basic input output system that is the first thing when your computer starts up your CPU goes to the BIOS and reads the initial program to get it to tell it where to go and get the say the Windows operating system or whatever it is you're running and sometimes you need to update your BIOS and in that case it would be a rewritable programmable uh, electrically programmable say read only a, well electrically erasable programmable read only memory and you can rewrite this this BIOS here. So this actually was developed before the various types of uh, programmable logic devices we've been talking about but it's really the same idea. And so of course this is tells you, tells you another way you can implement logic functions. Just calculate them and save them in memory. Save them in a non-volatile type of memory like this, the, the PROM. Now because this is completely general Right, you can for every one of these inputs, y0, y1, y2, and y3 can be completely arbitrary. We've got to have the full two to the n number of AND gates, and we've got to have one of the OR gates for each one of the output bits. Uh, but that's just another way to do a logic function calculate it, save it, and then just recall it. And the recall means put in the address that corresponds to the different bits of your A input variable, and then what comes out is the memory, which, which are, corresponds in this case to the calculated logic functions. Now, again, the, the original PROMs were used the, the fuse idea, and you, you could burn in the memory into them, and then you could never rewrite them.
So first you had proms like this, and they were permanent. They were you would write once. If you wanted to rewrite them, you had to take the chip out, throw it away, and program a new chip, put it in. Then people figured out how to make erasable proms. So erasable programmable read only memory. And you could, the first ones you had to shine, ult, there was a little window on the chip and you would shine ultraviolet light on it and it would cause the electrons stored on the, on the transistor gates to go away and then it would, that would erase it. Uh, and then they learned how to do that electrically. And now you have E, EEPROMs, electrically erasable, programmable, write only memories. Uh, and in fact, these days, you know, if you have like a USB flash drive, or if you have a computer with a solid state disk, these are really forms of variations on the EEPROM idea. So that gets back to the idea that you can think of uh, random access memory as just a way to implement logic functions. Or you can think of a logic function as just some data that you store, and then your logic function implementation just allows you to recall that data, which are the values of the logic function. So that previous discussion <clears throat> brings up to another approach uh, for programmable logic devices, and this would be an SRAM PLD. So SRAM stands for Static Random Access memory. Right? So when you know about RAM, you have RAM in your computer. These are static as opposed to most computers use what's called dynamic uh, RAM. And we're going to learn how to make an SRAM cell later in the course. Here's going to be our little logic diagram for it. It's going to have three inputs. DI, that's data in. S is the select. W is for write. And then one output, data out. And so here's the idea if s is equal to one then the chip is selected and if w equals one so it's selected and it's in write mode then the d out value is assigned whatever the dn is this is the memorization mode of the of the chip of the device you put in your bit zero or one you want to memorize and you You've selected the, the chip, and then you make right go high, and then this gets transferred to this, and then if you make right go low, then this gets latched in to that output and re remains that value. So for W equals zero, D out uh, remains constant. We say it's latched. We'll talk about latches later on. If your select signal goes to zero, D out goes to the high Z state. We talked about tri-state buffers, and we'd use one of these on this, so that this basically disconnects from anything it's connected to. All right, so we can actually put together these and make Oops. A circuit. Let's see, let's go like this. So here's our D out, D out. And each one of these. And they all have a D in. And they have a select and a write. And 
Yeah, all these DLs are going to be connected together. Now that that's no problem because they won't fight with each other provided only one at a time has its select signal high. All right, and then we're going to have D in over here. So here's where we can put our data in, and here's where we can read the data out. Now there are going to be four different select signals. Oops, not very good. And these are going to come out of a decoder. For decoder, and that's going to have two inputs, Let's say A0 and A1. All right, as you cycle A0 and A1 through all possible 0 and 1 values, you're going to turn on in sequence these different outputs. This will be select 0, this will be select 1, this will be select 2, and select 3. Okay, so you give me two bits and it will select one of these SRAM cells. And then the, uh, all of the right signals, let's do this in a different color here. All the right signals are also connected. Oops. Okay, so it looked like that. All right, so if we want to write to one of these different cells, we put the address of the cell in here. That will then uh, set to high that select signal. The other ones will all be disconnected because they'll have a, be in that high C state. And then if you make the right, this is the right signal here. If you make the right signal go high, whatever data is on the DI line will then be latched into that cell and then the D out will be fixed to that value until you rewrite it, okay? Then you can put write low, and now that memory has been stored. And then if you ever want to retrieve it, well, you just select by putting the, the right A0 and A1 values in here. You cause that select signal to go high. Then this guy then drives this D out line to be equal to its one or zero value that's been stored. So this would be an implementation here, this D out would then be a function of the uh, say A1 and the A0. And how would you actually implement that function? By calculating it and then just storing it, the different values for the, the different values that you want here in these four uh, SRAM cells by cycling through the different address values, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, storing the corresponding data. Now you can obviously expand this greatly. Uh, if I had, you know, 8 bits, an 8-bit decoder, that would be an 8 to, well, how, 2 to the 8. What's that? Well, 256. I could have 256 different stored uh, memory bits. And, of course, then if I also expanded this, say, horizontally, so for each one of these select signals, I would have multiple bits. Well, then I could have multiple logic functions. And, of course, that's just the way RAM, RAM works. This right here, we'd probably call that right enable. I'll just um, so again, there's a very you could say even a fine line in principle between just memory and programmable logic devices, programmable logic functions.